Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Business in Hawaii. I'm Dalen Yanagita and we are broadcasting live from the ThinkTech studios in downtown Honolulu. If you want to tune in live, we are at www.thinktechhawaii.com. While there, please subscribe to our programs and get on our mailing list. The theme of Business in Hawaii is to share with you stories of local businesses by local people and our guests share with us their journey to building successful businesses right here at home. In the Think Tech studio today is Asa Kajahiro. Asa is a financial thinker and communicator with the Investor Group Hawaii. Asa, so excited to have you. I've got to tell you, I've never met anyone with so much energy and passion for this unknown space um, that as individuals and as entrepreneurs, we always talk about. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to know how at the end of the day, you decided that your career space was going to be in financial advising. Wow, good question. So <laughs> that's going to take me back 15 years um, where my financial career started at uh, one of the bigger companies in the, in the country. And um, really, I think it was, it was the normal way. You know, you get hired to tell you what to do and you go do it. And in fact, you go do a little more because you're competitive and sort of afraid that um, you might not make it. And uh, that's really where it started, I think. And as, it, as time went by, 12, 13 years later, you know, I was still that competitor where it's like, man, you know, in the game of uh, financial advising, for the most part, it's about bringing assets in, assets under management, AUM, it's all over the place, right? And in order to get it, you need to know something. I mean, Honolulu is a very competitive place. There are many, many great institutions and great financial advisors. So I was thinking, like, you know, what, am I, what do I need to know, you know, to, uh, to really attract some of the more successful high net worth people from a business standpoint? And, um, and that's where I did a little exercise, and I came up with, with a thought, and it was around protection. And whether it was liability, or taxes, that people were more interested in that than, you know, uh, an investment where you could get almost anywhere. And so that's where the magic started to happen as I then became creative in outsourcing my knowledge. And that led me to start thinking different, asking different questions. And now I'm here. Uh, you know, I, I think what's an unknown space mm -hmm. for a lot of us lay people is what is a financial advisor? Because what you just said was liability, taxes, investments. Mm -hmm. Now, I think synonymous with financial advising, okay, investments. Right. They probably go together. But when you say liability and taxes, mm -hmm. My, some people might think, well, I'm going to leave some of that to my CPA, to my broker. So Absolutely. how does that all get wrapped in together? Yeah, and, and that's, um, that's a really, really good point and question because I was told the same thing. Hey, leave the tax thing to the CPAs and tax preparers. Leave the legal thing to the attorneys. Makes sense. Yet, we are empowered to open accounts, these qualified Accounts called IRAs and Roth IRAs. That's a tax decision. So we need to think about that. But the whole point in learning finance, right? Because financial advisor is, is to add value to the client relationship and experience. And so although I do not give legal and tax advice, if I study it and I can help people ask questions to our, our partners, the CPAs and the state attorneys, tax attorneys, real estate attorneys, then together as a professional group, we can provide a better service, uh, you know, for the household, for the business. And, um, and that really, you know, drove me because for many years, I made excuses in my head to not read the book because my company told me not to. But I just became very bored of talking about investments and the same thing over and over, I, you know, I became intrigued with the tax code and reading it and asking questions to CPAs and tax attorneys to try to see, 
where does it all fit in? To me, every part of the code is an opportunity for someone uh, to take advantage of and, and put themselves in a better spot. What so, about the liability aspect? Yeah, so the liability, same thing. You know, if you sort of understand uh, some of the terminology or some of the strategies and to say estate planning, trust planning, um, you know, it, it's, you, you can do the same thing. You can ask the questions, for example, uh, the adoption clause. Does it sit well with you that it may say that everyone adopted is considered family? And yet we see so many, um, you know, maybe second marriages or even first marriages where, where there's kids involved, there's yours, there's mine, and there's ours. And so then it becomes complicated when, with adoptions. And so sometimes uh, the questions the clients are just unaware of. And so as you, you know, talk to attorneys, you learn some of the things that they're concerned about, then you can pass on the question in a form of knowledge so that they can perhaps get more information or better knowledge. Okay, so I'm going to try not to ask all my personal <laughs> questions because <laughs> we, really, we really want to know about you and about mm. your passions. Um, but before I do that, why don't you just get a quick background on the investment group, <laughs> Investor Group Hawaii, mm -hmm. Um, what your role is there? Yeah. And okay, so Investor Group Hawaii is a company that I started back in September 2016. So I just made three years. And I was inspired by, by knowledge. I was inspired by math, by science, the universe. It sounds crazy, but it really, it really makes me um, try to think of the most difficult financial questions that I cannot answer. And, um, you know, I sort of, I guess, outgrew, you know, the company that I started with, and I, I love them to death. And if they're watching, you know, I love you guys. And um, I think I'm doing, I'm still doing this, uh, you know, for the people of Hawaii, for my, my old company. I feel like I can help them more by leaving in a weird way. But uh, I got started, you know, with the knowledge and and just sort of uh, the math not making sense at a certain point. So then, then, you know, I got really confident and. Um, a different sort of breakdown of how money was being uh, paid to me. So I thought that taking the leap of faith, you know, and starting my own business would be the best thing for me, even though I was lead, helping lead this, this other company and leaving a lot of people that I love sort of behind or quitting on them. Um, but what pulled me through is that when I, when I thought, when I think about my career purpose, I think about everyone in Hawaii. I think about you know my upbringing. Um, as, you know, for my mom and dad, they had a janitorial business that I worked in um, you know, seven days a week from eighth grade to twelfth grade. And I you know I think about you know everybody from you know the uber successful to the rank and file, you know whatever you want to say. And I I just feel like everybody deserves to be helped. And yet sometimes, unfortunately lower you are in the tax bracket, sometimes it's harder to get help because of the way the money flows. So I, I, I looked at this as an opportunity to uh, create a boutique shop that, and uh, to try to execute a vision of what I thought a financial advisor should be or strive to be and really uh, try to make a difference in, in the world. Uh, but start with Hawaii. So what's amazing is that your passion is for helping people as opposed to building your own wealth, right? <laughs> I mean, as yeah. a business owner, we all want to lead successful businesses and, and drive revs and, and those things, but your real passion is education and mm. passing, paying that forward, if you will, um, to the general population. And, and I think what's really unique about you is you want to do that in a transparent way, mm. good, bad, and ugly. Tell mm. me about your passion and education. It's an obsession. Um, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I like that. You know, I like, I like being around obsessed people like yourself even, you know, when it comes to HR. Like, I mean, to me, it's, it's just, it's contagious and I feed off of that. But um, it's weird, man. It's like this, this thing inside of me that um, I just cannot deny, you know, and it's like, if I come across something difficult like opportunity zones, 
And then there's like this whole 150 page report. And it's, it's kind of hard when you come home and after dinner and the, the kid is asleep and you know, you kind of want to watch Sports Center, but then, you know, what goes through my head is, is, is the people are counting on me. You know, that, that I feel protective over Hawaii. Um, that, you know, when, when people come down, let's just say from the mainland and do some education, um, you know, my expectations on them are very high and, and I want them to bring it. I want them to bring value, you know. So I think what, I, what I've discovered is that there's two forms of education. You know, there's the kind that sort of define things and like what is a mutual fund, how does it work? And then there's this other kind that sort of doesn't involve a product commission sale or fee, but it involves knowledge that starts with a thought. Then, you, you know, you say, wow, well, okay, I'm thinking different. And now I'm maybe going to take a different action. And an action could be as simple, I'm going to, you know, email my CPA and ask them about, you know, why I should do a rollover with two IRA. And why is that better for me? And, and then the action will be different because I understand that in order for me, it's, it's nice to, to want to teach and do all this stuff. Right? But unless people can change habit, then we're really, are we really doing anything. So part of the drive is not only to get knowledge, but to be creative, to be engaging, and to try to be a little bit entertaining so that you, know, you can sort of manipulate it the knowledge so that people can understand it and, and just get the wheels turning a little bit. Maybe ask a question. I think of that, that, that's really fun. <laughs> like, I just really enjoy um, helping people and, 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 and hearing their reactions. Man, I wish I met you earlier, or I didn't know that. That's a good one. I, I, just, I just love that. So who's your clientele? Are they individual people? Are they yes. people like myself? Or are they businesses? Are they, who, are, who yes. are they? all of the above. All of the above. People of any age. As long as they have a social security number. Um, if they have income, that's helpful. But it, it really, really anyone, you know, it's, it's just money movement. Uh, so yeah, businesses, people. I probably have more fun with businesses. I think there's a misconception about financial advisors and that, oh, well, if I don't have any money, I can talk to a financial advisor. Mm. Well, what about that? Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting point because now, you know, if, let's just say for the most part, that's, that's right. Where some, most financial advisors, if you don't have investable dollars, going back to the assets under management, then... You know, they, they really can't help because nobody gets paid. However, there are other financial advisors, independent financial advisors that can charge differently, maybe more like an attorney, a retainer fee, something like that. So I think the, the point here is that we need to really ask ourselves, who are we paying? What value I need, if I know that? And am I, right, am I with the right person? Who should I interview? Where can I look for? answers now there's a million dollar question yeah. <laughs> how do i find the right person right? yeah 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 um we do need to go to a short break uh, but when we come back uh our viewers are entrepreneurs mm. business owners successful business owners people who want to roll into starting up businesses i want to ask you what kind of financial advice the advisors in general would give and what advice they don't give, awesome. more importantly. Awesome, looking forward to it. All right, we're gonna take that break. This is Business in Hawaii. We'll see you back here shortly. Aloha, my name is Wendy Lowe, and I want you to join me as we take our health back. On my show, all we do is talk about things in everyday life, in Hawaii or abroad. I have guests on board that will just talk about different aspects of health in every, in every way, whether it's medical health, nutritional health, diabetic health, you name it, we'll talk about it. Even financial health. We'll even have some of the Miss Hawaii's on board and all the different topics that I feel will make your health and your lifestyle a lot better. So come join me. I welcome you to take your health back. Mahalo. Hello, I'm Mufi Hanneman. I want to tell you about a great show that appears on Think Tech Hawaii. It's all about tourism. In fact, we call it Tourism 101. 
where we talk about the issues and challenges that faces our number one industry throughout the state. We'll have some interesting guests, some very informative dialogue, and allow you an opportunity to maybe learn a little bit more about why this industry is so important for our state. It's been great for us in the past. We need it today, and especially going forward. That's Tourism 101 on Think Tech Hawaii. Mahalo. Welcome back. This is Business in Hawaii. With us today is Asa Kajihiro, who is a thought leader in the financial planning space. More than a thought leader, I love that you bring transparency to an issue that might be pretty gray to a lot of folks. And mm -hmm. what I want to pin you down on is recently we've heard of wealth managers, wealth mm -hmm. management. Is, is that the same or is it different than financial advisors, financial planning? Great question. I th think the answer is it could be both. You know, a financial advisor could be a wealth manager, and there are different wealth management services. So what comes to my mind are investments. When I think of wealth management, it's about investments, and typically in the financial advisor arena, you're talking about securities, some form of security. And I think the term uh, became more popular as the investment that the advisory type investment service became more popular, where you know you'd invest in a large platform, you know whether that's stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, and it sort of rebalances it for you, and it's very inexpensive, and so the wealth managers that represent that service are are partnering in a lot of times with financial advisors like myself to then deliver to the public. So what's interesting on the difference and the way that I would say it's different is that wealth management, investment base, value to grow money, protect money, more tax efficiency. Financial planning, advising, as I would define it, would be the coordination of much more than that, as that would be a piece of say, an IRA or a trust account. But there are real estate assets, other business assets, passive income. Um, you know, LLC, business entity type uh, structure and design strategies that I think are just so different. You know, when do I use an S Corp or C Corp? You know, should I, you know, how should I write my operating agreement? And should it be member manager, ma you know, manager manager, like all these things that are part of finance that I know I'm not 100% um, confident that advisors like myself are really doing. So it's okay, but I think that uh, to be inspired as a financial advisor to think a little bit differently and to perhaps partner with some of the local professionals to add something greater uh, would be a way to tie in um, more value, more services uh, than wealth management because then it becomes this, this sort of competition of who can get the cheapest fee sometimes. You know, and um, the market's been strong for 10 years. So people are doing really well, but and you just see our margins are shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. So how do you add value? How are we going to add value in the face of a recession? When we, if we lose 20, 30, whatever percentage, will our clients still value us? Will, will we be able to sleep well at night? What's our added value? What are we reading? It's a great question for financial advisor. What are you reading? What are you excited about? Wow. Okay. I'm not going to ask you what you're reading because I know that this will be, <laughs> that will be long, but um, I'm, going, I'm going to cross the gray area a little bit. I know that you can't give financial advice, but I really want to get your thoughts on some of the things that entrepreneurs should think about in terms of financial advice or what they should look for from their financial advisor. Because as entrepreneurs, we have so many options. Yeah. And I, I, I want to get your take on that. Yeah, so entrepreneurs, it's a very broad term, right? You could be, a business could be really big, it could be really small. So for this sake of discussion, I will talk about entrepreneurs like myself, where we're, you know, one person, no employees, and sort of taking this leap of faith and, um, you know, maybe some, some questions to ask. Because I kind of give advice, maybe we'll, we'll ask the questions. And um, 
Let's say that um, I'm going to leave my employer. This is my employer. I'm going to leave uh, for whatever reason. I just feel it's a calling to me, right? And I got this, uh, this, this, this 401k plan, and I got, you know, the company is so generous. They match me for my pre-tax, you know, and now, you know, I got to do a, what people typically have to do, which is a rollover. So let's think about this, business people, okay? Let's think about saving money on taxes first. And then we'll kind of lead into some other stuff. But in the state of Hawaii, pensions are not income state taxable. So for income tax, federal, state, state of Hawaii does not tax Social Security, pensions, or any free money a company gives you. So let's say I've been matched 3% or you know, whatever. So in my 401k are like two buckets. The employer money and my contribution or the employee money. When I leave and do a rollover, what typically happens is that we co-mingle these assets into one IRA. Because why open two? I have to pay two fees. I will open one. In fact, I'll put it in with the other stuff. And that's where a lot of mistakes happen because now we now the CPAs, when you take the money out in the future, don't know what is what. So I call it the dual IRA rollover strategy. And the question would be, hey, Mr. CPA or tax preparer, should I open two IRAs when I leave my company to start a business so I can put my contributions in one and the employer money in the other? Would that save me state income tax when I take the money out in the future? And that would be tip one. State income tax in Hawaii can be as high as 11% in the highest bracket. And in my opinion, taxes saved is money made, which is controllable through knowledge, thinking different with a different course of action. And um, that would be one. Okay, well, I know for a fact that there are a number of options that, that, that could be an option for entrepreneurs leaving or not being a W-2 employee anymore, yeah. right? And going into a 10, 1099 world, no mm. employees like we were talking about. What are our options to, because it's still important for us to plan. Yep. So what are those other options? Yeah, yeah. Because as, as a single entity, I, in my layman's knowledge, I can't open up a 401k, right? Well, I think that's what most people think. You don't even think about it because it's, it's really unknown. And then as soon as you start to maybe research it or go down that road, you'll see the cost of administering one, which then it could be sort of disengaging. And, and so I think, you know, moving forward, so this is separate from a rollover. This is like, okay, I started my business. I still want to save for retirement. And so now I, what should I do? Should I do the, this 401k or potentially a SEP IRA or, or nothing? But let's say we're, we're looking for a tax shelter, a tax strategy, and it's going to be one of the two things. And I think for the most part, business owners are, are choosing to do the SEP IRA for several reasons. It's very simple. It's very inexpensive. And it's, it's as easy as making a phone call and setting it up. A 401k is a tremendous opportunity for 1099 business owners, especially with no employees. And it's... Um... That's not what we know as, <laughs> as entrepreneurs, as 1099s, single, single, mm -hmm. single person LLCs. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. not what we think. Right, right. And, and for good reason. Uh, the knowledge is not really going around town. And we do not need to feel bad, Hawaii, because it's really not going around the whole country. So, and I found that out because I had this question that came up in my head. It was... You know, for 401ks, there's three ways to put money in. There's pre-tax, there's Roth, and there's this thing called after-tax. And uh, one of my teammates, Javin Nohara, who is an absolute rock star, we sat at Leaky Leaky Driving, and we were like, why is this there? So anyway, long story short, it got me to, to the 401k with no employees, getting back to that versus the SEP. And what makes this, this, the Solo K so unique, Solo K is just a nickname, it's really just a 401k plan, is that when there are no employees, 
The plan is not subject to Department of Labor rules. Not subject to that. Which then means, and for a lot of the viewers who do self-directed IRAs, which is very different than a regular IRA, when, when there are no DOL requirements or no employees, a 401k with no employees becomes self-directed, which means, for the ladies out there, that I can invest in alternative assets like real estate, private businesses, tax liens within the solo K. So that presents a unique opportunity because some of us don't like the stock market. We're better business people. We want to invest in private equity or different things. So it's possible in that space. The other thing from a tax planning perspective is if you are in the boat of, hey, Roth is the greatest thing since sliced bread. I really want to take advantage of this Roth program, which is tax-free earnings over time. It's better to compound tax-free than taxable, obviously. One of the problems is, well, if I make only, you know, if I make too much money, if I make more than you know, 180,000 filing jointly, 190 something is around there, that I cannot contribute, which is true for Roth IRA rules. There's backdoor ways, another, you know, show. But um, it's not true for 401ks. You can make as much as you want. And on top of that, you can, you can do what's called the mega backdoor Roth IRA. Google that, mega backdoor Roth. And it allows you to put in up to $56,000 as a contribution into your 401k plan. $56,000 every single year, even if you're making a billion dollars a year. There are no income requirements. So imagine do that for 10 years. Right? I'm fortunate enough to save $56,000, which is, is a huge <laughs> amount, right? I mean, it's not. <laughs> For everyone, but there's somebody watching that can do that. Say, hey, maybe I can do that. After 10 years or so, now they got half a million bucks, or you know, hopefully more, in this, and now they can get creative and invest in property. Imagine a rental in a Roth, tax-free. I think it's a beautiful thing. I think anytime you can change the the math, where now instead of having it taxed at whatever bracket as far as uh, passive income that it stays within the Roth world and it, it compounds in there, or it's distributing tax-free. The numbers change big time. You just made something boring really sexy. <laughs> <laughs> that is entertaining. <laughs> you know, I knew this was gonna happen and we are out of time, but mm. um, I know that you got some new stuff going on and yes. I want you to tell us about. Yes, started a company called Think Now Financial Education. And it sort of you know, came about from doing, uh, educating uh, you know, folks for 401ks, which I help advise on. And, and you know, just taking a different twist, you know, people started going, Asa, can you come out and, and you know, just do the education? Can we just pay you for that? We don't want you to manage our 401k. And that's sort of how it started. And um, you know, I Googled it, financial education in Hawaii, didn't see anything. And I thought, man, you know, why not? Why not do something? And, and this way, I can reach more people. You know, myself, um, with the team, we can handle so much. But if we have a platform with many people, some, like, like this platform, and then, then maybe we can help one person. So tell us people. how we can find you then. Yeah, you can find me. I have a really weird name. It's <laughs> Asa Kajihiro, A-S-A Kajihiro. You can Google me and find me. You can uh, reach me, my website, asa at investorgrouphi.com. Or you can call me at 808-425-5035. We got to have you back because uh, I got a number of questions for you, including uh, what questions should we ask a financial advisor when we're interviewing them? I mean, I, that would be a great that, next show. No, yes, it will yes. be. So I'm counting on you. Thank you. Um, we are out of time. Thank you to Asa for joining us. A huge thank you to the amazing production staff here in the studio. If you would like to be a guest on our show, please like us and subscribe and leave a comment below. Business in Hawaii airs every Thursday at 2 p.m. Look forward to seeing you here next week.